All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Griffiths. I'm the host for uh, today's uh, technical webinar series presentation. We have an interesting topic today. It's on the full scale Fenton's chemistry oxidation using native iron for the destruction of 1,4-dioxane in recovery groundwater. It's a really interesting, innovative approach to uh, degrading 1,4-dioxane in a XC2 treatment system. Uh, so we're uh, extracting groundwater from an impacted plume, treating it XC2 through a destructive mechanism for 1,4-dioxane. Just some housekeeping measures. Uh, thanks very much, for everybody, for joining. This is our monthly technical webinar series presentation. Uh, we have about an hour scheduled, uh, about 40 or so minutes of presentation, and then questions and answers at the end. So uh, if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to enter them into the chat if you desire, or uh, during the question and answer period, we'll open the, uh, open the mics for anyone that wants to uh, ask their questions directly. If you would, in the chat or uh, by voice, if you can identify yourself and your organization in your question, that'd be really helpful, just so we know uh, who we're talking to while we're answering your questions. Um, during the presentation, all of our lines will be muted to try to cut down on any background uh, noise. Nobody wants to hear the dog barking or the trash truck going by. So we'll have a nice presentation and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Just so everyone is aware, um, this technical webinar is being recorded. We'd like to make these available after the fact on our innovation page, uh, which there's a link in the, uh, the meeting maker as well as the uh, presentation flyer so that you can access this presentation and all of our other technical content uh, after the fact or at your leisure. So next slide, please, Ajish. Thank you. Our speaker today is Ajish Nambiar. Uh, Ajish is a principal engineer with Parsons, and he provides project delivery of capital projects from planning and concept development through engineering and detailed design, construction, commissioning, and startup. And he specializes on industrial wastewater treatment he has about 15 years of experience in working on groundwater treatment, industrial, municipal, and wastewater treatment, and water reuse projects. So without uh, further ado, I'll be quiet and I'll let our primary presenter, Ajish, take it away. It's all yours. Thank you, Dan. Uh, once again, welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, before I get into the subject of this presentation, uh, just quickly, a quick review of one of our core values. Today we'll be talking about sustainability. Uh, sustainability, simply put, is our conscious effort to perform our work with minimal impact to the environment. Simple enough, but how do we incorporate sustain sustainability into our projects? Uh, now, most of my projects have been capital infrastructure projects, and until a few years back, there was no real guidance or framework for sustainable delivery of infrastructure projects. What we had was lead for build, buildings and envision for infrastructure project is what lead is for building. So envision is a framework that provides the guidance in the planning, design and delivery of sustainable and resilient infrastructure. Uh, envision is a rating system what, that is designed to promote sustainable performance and resiliency of physical infrastructure, which helps implement a cost effective resource effective efficient and an adaptable long-term infrastructure investment. It was developed and is being managed by ISI or the Institute of Sustainable Infrastructure, uh, which was established in 2010 by the American Society of Civil Engineers, American Council of Engineering Companies, and American Public Works Association. ISI collaborated with Harvard University to develop Envision. Now, Envision is applicable to entire gamut of infrastructure projects, both public and private infrastructure for a project value less than a million dollar to, to multi-billion dollar projects. So Envision is a framework that includes 64 sustainability and resilience indicators called credits, organized around five categories, uh, quality of life, leadership, resource allocation, natural world, and climate and resilience. Each of the 64 credits has multiple levels of achievement or performance goals, from slightly improving beyond conventional practice to conserving and restoring communities and environments. 
The project team assesses achievement in each of the 64 credits and establishes how well the project addresses the full range of sustainability indicators and then identify opportunities to pursue higher performance. Now the client may choose to pursue an envision rating for the project by verification through ISI, who verifies the total number of points achieved and, and the credits, and, and, and upon verification would uh, certify the project as verified, uh, and, it, and the rating goes up to silver, gold, and platinum. And platinum meets about 50% of the total points uh, that can be achieved uh, from the 64 credits. Alternatively, the client may choose Envision as a tool to meeting project and program or corporate goals. Um, for example, in the beginning of the project, a pre-assessment checklist would be completed to assess where the project stands within the range of sustainability indicators. And from there, uh, goals could be developed to meet sustainability requirements. Uh, for more information on Envision, um, uh, you could visit the website, ISI website, uh, sustainableinfrastructure.org. Moving on into the content of the presentation, uh, we'll be first discussing or looking at the background and site history. Uh, we will then review some of the uh, typical 1,4 dioxin treatment technologies. Uh, we'll then go into bench and pilot testing and quickly review where we are at in the full scale design. So uh, Parsons operates and maintains a groundwater treatment plan for industrial client. Uh, we have been operating this plan for about 10 years now. Uh, the groundwater treatment system consists of about six extraction wells that collects uh, groundwater and pumps it to the groundwater treatment plant, which was designed for an average flow rate of 400 GPM. The treated water is then discharged into an infiltration basin from where it percolates into the groundwater aquifer. Uh, the picture on the right hand side shows the uh, groundwater treatment plant and the infiltration basin. Now the groundwater treatment plant was designed to treat, uh, uh, to basically to, to meet groundwater discharge standards for the state. Um, basically the treatment system removes nuisance metals wine and chlorine and other VOCs, and PFOA, uh, a PFAS uh, compound. A little more about the treatment system. Uh, uh, so the water coming in uh, is first oxidized. Uh, a two-step oxidized oxidation process is implemented uh, to remove all the nuisance metals, and especially iron, uh, which is in high concentration in the groundwater. Uh, oxidation is by step one is cascade aerator, followed by dosing the incoming water with sodium hypochlorite. Uh, the precipitating solids is then removed by the clarification system, uh, and then the water moves on to sand filters where it is polished for TSS. Uh, once pre filtration is completed, water then flows into an air stripper where vinyl chloride is removed. Uh, from there, it moves on into the GAC system where PFOA is removed and VOCs are removed. Uh, the treated water is then uh, discharged into the groundwater infiltration basin. Uh, also, the precipitated solids is collected uh, and handled by a sludge handling system. Uh, the sludge handling system consists of sludge drying beds where uh, the collected solids is dewatered and before it is hauled off-site for disposal. Slide here shows the existing treatment plant. Uh, the picture on the right bottom is a, a closer view of the groundwater treatment facility. Uh, the building on the top of the picture is the pre-treatment building uh, where all the pre-treatment step occurs. Uh, the, ca the cascade aerator is right next to the uh, the pretreatment building. Uh, the 
building at the bottom of the photograph is the filter building, uh, which houses the sand filters, the vinyl or the air strippers and the GAC units. And the structure on the right hand side, oh, sorry, the structure on the left hand side is the sand drying beds where where this collected sludge is dried before hauling off site. Now, uh, the state uh, adopted a new groundwater discharge standard for 1,4 dioxane. And if you look at the table, 1,4 uh, dioxane concentration coming into the groundwater treatment plant uh, range from one micrograms per liter to about nine micrograms per liter. Uh, this concentration was above the newly adopted uh, groundwater discharge standard. Also shown is some of the uh, concentrations seen in the wells, and you see four of the six wells uh, are showing concentrations above the groundwater discharge standard. So this necessitated a requirement to upgrade the groundwater treatment plan uh, for 1,4 dioxane removal. Two other items I want to point out here is the iron concentration. Uh, the iron concentration coming into the uh, treatment plant was about 40 to 50 milligrams per liter. Uh, high iron concentration is a characteristic of, of this region. Uh, also to note is the pH. Uh, the pH is generally in the acidic side of uh, neutral. And we'll be touching upon this uh, again later on this presentation. Before we uh, talk about uh, treatment technologies, just a brief overview of 1,4 dioxane itself. 1,4 uh, dioxane is an emerging contaminant uh, listed in the emerging contaminant uh, listed in the US EPA emerging contaminant list. Uh, it was sent, it was used basically as a solvent stabilizer. Uh, it's a synthetic industrial chemical and is typically found in contaminated sites uh, that has chlorinated solvents. It's all been, also been seen in municipal wastewater, uh, primary source being shampoos and detergents. So it's has, it has been a, a contaminant of concern on water reuse projects uh, as well. It's very miscible with water and, and therefore it's highly mobile. Uh, the EPA health advisory for 1,4 dioxane is 0.35 micrograms per liter. And, and just as reference, the, the new um, discharge standard that was implemented by the state was close to this 0.35 micrograms per liter uh, advisory level. There's currently no EPA MCL uh, established for 1,4 dioxane. However, some states have established drinking water and groundwater discharge guidelines. Uh, the table on the right hand side shows several states that has established guidelines for 1,4 dioxane. Treatment technologies. Uh, we used a tiered approach uh, for selection of the technology. Uh, we first had a paper evaluation uh, followed by uh, technology selected for band scale testing. And following band scale testing, we had a pilot testing. We had pilot testing as well. Slide here shows some of the typical uh, technologies used for organic contaminant removal. Uh, coming into this evaluation, we knew a stripper and carbon adsorption uh, would have or has a low uh, efficacy for 1,4 dioxin treatment, uh, specifically because of the unique physical characteristic of 1,4 dioxin. Uh, for example, uh, the Henry's constant, uh, which is a measure of volatility of a compound, is four for one for dioxin is four orders of magnitudes lower than vinyl chloride, a compound typically removed by air strippers. Uh, one for dioxin also has low uh, partitioning coefficients, makes it, making it difficult to remove by carbon adsorption. There are sites where biological oxidation uh, has been implemented. Uh, one example is the Lowry landfill site where 1,4 dioxane is treated by a co-metabolic process during biological oxidation. Uh, Parsons was involved in the band scale and pilot testing uh, of this project uh, and also went on to uh, design, construct, and currently operating the uh, treatment facility. 
Now the go-to treatment for 1,4-dioxin is advanced oxidation processes and are, are also called as AOPs. And within the AOPs, UV peroxide and ozone peroxide has the largest number of installation. Both UV peroxide and ozone peroxide are commercially available systems. Uh, Fenton's chemistry, however, is more engineered system. Uh, Fenton's chemistry has been around for 100 years or more. Uh, it's a pretty mature technology. Two of the uh, typical or uh, two of the criteria, which is typically disadvantages for Fenton's chemistry was negated for this site. Uh, one being a typical Fenton's chemistry oxidation process requires ferrous iron that is brought from an external site uh, for the chemistry to occur. occur. Uh, I mentioned earlier the site has ferrous in its groundwater. So this was beneficial for Fenton's chemistry to be implemented at the site or considered at the site. Also, a second major drawback with Fenton's chemistry typically is the generation of uh, iron sludge. But as I mentioned earlier in, in the groundwater treatment system description, we already have a sludge handling and processing facility at the site. And, and based on this evaluation and our, our negation of two of these uh, criteria, uh, Fenton's chemistry became promising for this site. We also looked at amber sub adsorptive media uh, during the pilot test. This is an uh, and synthetic engineered media which has high adsorption capacity for specific compounds. And, and we'll touch upon all of these technologies in a couple of slides uh, in this presentation. Uh, so what is an advanced oxidation process? Advanced oxidation process is the use of hydroxyl radicals uh, to destroy the contaminant. Um, the hydroxyl radical is generated from by uh, generated from hydrogen peroxide in the presence of uh, an activator or a, a catalyst such as UV, ozone, or ferrous two. The graph on the right hand side kind of uh, shows the different uh, oxidants typically used in water treatment and uh, water treatment industry. Uh, and, and the graph shows the electrode reduction poten potential, which is essentially the potency of the uh, uh, treatment agent. Uh, and, and hydroxyl radical has one of the highest uh, uh, ERPs amongst uh, the treatment chemicals. Known. Uh, just for reference on the right hand side is oxygen and hypochlorite. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the plant uses air for oxidation and hypochlorite as a as a two step oxidation process for removal of metals. So so it gives you an idea or reference point where hydroxyl radical is uh, compared to the oxidants used at site. Uh, just a UV reactor system. Uh, uh, it's UV peroxide is a straightforward system. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is introduced into inline into the water. Uh, the peroxide dose water then goes into a UV reactor. Uh, a UV reactor is a low pressure vessel uh, which has an array of UV lamps. Uh, and, 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 and when inside the vessel, the, the water is essentially treated. Uh, on the right hand side is uh, a UV peroxide system that was constructed uh, for the treatment of 1,4-dioxane and TCE. Uh, this was installed at the Tucson Airport Remediation Project. The system here treats about 7 to 8 million gallons of water per day. An ozone peroxide system is a little more involved process. It has uh, several uh, systems running in tandem uh, to generate ozone. The ozone form is then used as the catalyst for uh, generation of hydroxyl radicals. Uh, I won't go. I won't go into the details of the of the system, uh, but the picture on the right hand side shows a, a hypox 
system by APT Water, which was used, uh, which was built for remediation of uh, DCE contaminated water. Now, between UV and ozone, UV system requires a much more cleaner water or pre-treated water, uh, whereas uh, uh, ozone system is much more accommodating on the water quality. Uh, it's one of the major difference between the two technologies. Fenton's chemistry. Again, Fenton's chemistry is an engineered, uh, engineered system. Uh, basically consists of a couple of tanks, tanks and mixtures, uh, mixers. Uh, the contaminated water coming in is pH, pH adjusted to about 3 to 5. Now the pH of 3 to 5 is where ferrous is the most dominant ion species. Uh, so that's that's the reason uh, typically the pH of the water is adjusted. Once the pH is adjusted, uh, it moves on to the Fenton's reactor where hydrogen peroxide is dosed into the system. Uh, hydrogen peroxide in the presence of ferrous ion uh, produces hydroxyl radicals. The hydroxyl radicals act upon the organic contaminant, uh, breaking it down. Now, first intermediate are the, uh, the intermediate that is observed when 1,4-dioxane is structured is, is uh, usually carboxylic acid or, or fatty acids. The fatty acids and it goes further oxidation uh, until it's, it is completely mineralized. Uh, the, the equation at the bottom shows the complete mineralization equation for 1,4-dioxane union uh, with Fenton's chemistry. Another important item is the reaction time. Uh, Fenton's chemistry has been uh, has been. Uh, has been uh, researched quite a bit. Um, there are several research studies that has studied the degra degradation of 1,4-dioxane used in Fenton's. Um, and, and the graph on the right is one such uh, uh, one, one such study. Few key uh, key things uh, with Fenton's chemistry is one uh, few key parameters for Fenton's chemistry. One is the pH. Two is the hydrogen peroxide dose and three is the reaction time. Now all this uh, is based upon the uh, water matrix in question. So it is very critical that a band scale study be performed uh, when considering uh, Fenton's chemistry for treating 1,4-dioxane. Uh, next is the amber sob system. Uh, Amber sob system is, is basically a synthetic engineered media, which is known to have large pore size distribution, helps absorbing miscible compounds. Uh, a flow diagram here, uh, the water, pre-treated water, goes into a lead lag configuration of the amber sob vessels, uh, which is then treated, uh, which basically strips off or adsorbs the contaminant in question uh, from the water stream. Uh, the amber saw media can be regenerated on site uh, using superheated steam. The steam basically strips off the contaminant from the medium bed, making it available for the uh, next uh, or processing cycle. The picture on the right is uh, an application where amber saw media was in installed or the system was installed for one for dioxin removal. The, the benefit of amber saw media is it doesn't require chemicals. Uh, however, the drawback is uh, unlike AOP systems, which destroys uh, the contaminant of concern, um, Ampersoft Media is just a re removal mechanism. Uh, so, so the regenerated, uh, regenerated waste stream has to be disposed off-site or requires further handling. Fence testing. So, based on the paper evaluation, we selected UV and uh, UV peroxide and Fenton's chemistry for bench testing. And the next few slides will review some of the results. Practice. So, slide here is the bench testing for Fenton's chemistry. The photograph on the right hand side is the apparatus or the jar test that was performed for Fenton's bench test. Uh, 
water was the uh, Parsons performed this bench test at the at the groundwater treatment plant. Uh, water was collected uh, at the influence of the treatment plant. The water was spiked uh, to a concentration of about from anywhere from 35 micrograms per liter to about 60, 60 65 micrograms per liter. Uh, this basically meant that the spike concentration was about six to ten times the average influent concentration, and it was about double or more than double the highest concentration that were, that was say in one of the wells. Coming into the uh, bench test study, we knew the AOPs could remove vinyl chloride, so we in our, while tracking the contaminants, we tracked both. Uh, one for dioxane and vinyl chloride. We also tracked uh, PFOA because PFOA is being treated at the site. Uh, we also tracked for bromate formation. Uh, AOPs are generally known to form bromate depending on the technology being used, and therefore uh, bromate was tracked uh, during the testing. The graph on the right hand side shows the test results. Uh, the x axis shows the test itself and the y axis shows the uh, concentration. Uh, so we had three uh, tests at peroxide concentrations of 250 milligrams per liter. Uh, we saw complete destruction of 1,4-dioxane to uh, method detection limit. Upon seeing that, we further went on and, and reduced the concentration of peroxide from 100 milligrams per liter to a final test at 50 milligrams per liter. Uh, we also did each of this test at various HRTs, uh, anywhere from 15 minutes up to 60 minutes. Uh, we saw complete removal of 1,4-dioxane and, and vinyl chloride during the entire uh, study process. Uh, we did not see any removal of PFOA, and we did not see any bromide formation during uh, following testing. Up following the treatment scheme. Uh, UV peroxide was the testing for UV bench test for UV peroxide was performed at a vendor uh, location. Um, water spiked water with 1,4 dioxane with about 50 micrograms per liter was sent uh, collected by Parson and sent to the vendor facility. Uh, testing included. Uh, dosing with 15 milligrams per liter, about just an above average concentration typically used for UV peroxide. And then we ran tests uh, for varying uh, uh, UV intensity from 1000 up to 4000 millijoules per centimeter squared. We did see significant removal of 1,4-dioxane. However, uh, we did not see removal to the target concentration close to 0.35 micrograms per liter. Uh, and at a high dosage concentration, we also saw bromate formation in the system. Uh, bromate is another uh, regulated EPA uh, regulated compound, has a MCL of about 10 micrograms per liter. So, uh, and, and similar to Fenton's, we saw completely more vinyl chloride. However, there was no PFOA removal. Now, based on the band scale testing uh, uh, and, and the observations made during the test, uh, Fenton's chemistry was recommended for pilot testing. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, Ambersoft Media was also pilot tested uh, based on client direction. Pilot testing. Uh, pilot testing was performed over a period of about three to four weeks for each pilot test. Uh, pilot test for Fenton's began late February and continued to middle of middle to late March. Uh, Ambersoft Media was tested in April. Before we get into the pilot test, we wanted to take a step back and see where exactly the treatment technology would fit into the existing treatment process. Uh, the most logical uh, location for implementing Fenton's was up front of the treatment process. Uh, Fenton's would not only remove 1,4-dioxane and vinyl chloride, but would also remove the nuisance metals 
currently being removed at the site. Uh, so our approach was uh, complete removal of runfodioxane and vinyl chloride, nuisance removal, and, and, the, and the treated water would then go into the sand filters for TSS polishing and into the GAG for PFOA removal and VOC polishing before being discharged into the basins. Slide here shows the Fenton's chemistry setup. Uh, the drawing up is the, on top is the uh, process flow diagram for the setup. Uh, the system was designed for about 3.2 GPM of continuous flow. Uh, we installed three reactors, uh, each about 50 gallons capacity each. Reactor one was a pH adjustment, initial adjustment reactor, followed by Fenton's reactor, uh, where the treatment of 1,4-dioxin and vinyl chloride would occur. And the third reactor was the pH readjustment, where pH would be dropped to uh, brought up to uh, about 7.5 to 8. And this is where all the metals would be removed. A picture on the right hand side is the setup for the Fenton's. Uh, up front is the first tank on top is the reactor one, followed by the Fenton's reactor, and then the pH uh, readjustment reactor. And in the reactor here, you show the you see the red tinge of water, basically, uh, basically in, uh, telling us that iron has been precipitated in the system. We approached the test. Uh, we we planned the test in to to do four different types of testing. Uh, test one was to validate the bench test results, which was 50 milligrams per liter of H2O2 dose for 15 minutes at the pH of 3. Once the validation test was completed, our plan was to do optimization tests. Uh, we ran tests anywhere with H2O2 ranging anywhere from 50 to 40 up to 25. Test three was HRT optimization test, and test four was pH optimization test. Now the way the test was, was conducted uh, was, uh, Every day the system would be turned on. Uh, the test parameters would be established. And once the test parameters are established, the system would run for a few hours uh, to achieve stabilization or steady state. And following a few hours of running, uh, we would sample uh, for the contaminants that we were tracking and send it to the analytical lab. Uh, we tracked one for dioxane, vinyl chloride, and metals. And slide here shows the test results. Uh, so we had about 16 tests, uh, uh, and, and the tests have been color coded here. Uh, about seven baseline tests, uh, about four dose variation tests, a couple of uh, HRT variation tests, and a pH uh, adjustment test. Uh, under all test conditions, we saw one for dioxin a destruction, complete destruction of one for dioxin to uh, method detection limit. We also saw that metals were being removed, which were consistent to the performance in at the uh, groundwater treatment facility. So a couple of key notes here based on the testing was one, we could achieve uh, one for dioxin at much further uh, lower concentrations of hydrogen peroxide, which basically meant our O&M costs would go down. And I think the second and most key uh, information that we got from this test is that the test could be performed at a higher pH. And, and based on our understanding of the groundwater and also based on some literature information, we think uh, the pH could be further optimized to closer to native pH. Uh, and and what this does is the amount of chemicals required to bring the pH of the water down and back up goes down substantially. Next is the uh, Ambersoft Media Treatment System. Our approach for Ambersoft Media Pilot was to tap off the filter effluent, uh, run the system, uh, uh, because the, uh, because Ambersoft required a pre-treated water. 
Uh, so on a full scale facility, you would have the filter water going into an amber sub system, which would then go into GAC units for VOC and other VOC and PFOA removal. Uh, slide here shows uh, the pilot setup uh, uh, for Amber SOP system. Uh, we have Conics. Uh, uh, this was a ECT2, a Montrose company uh, furnished and run system. Uh, so basically, the pilot system consists of a couple of uh, columns in parallel. Uh, there's a small boiler unit in here which is used for regeneration for uh, basically developing steam and regenerating of the media. The test was run for about four weeks uh, continuously uh, and at the end of every week the media was regenerated so there was a total of about four regeneration cycle. The graph on the right hand side shows uh, the concentration and the volume treated over the period of four weeks. Uh, we did see complete removal of uh, one photoxane and vinyl chloride through the lead vessel over the period of the first three weeks. Uh, now it's important that you see breakthrough uh, to uh, estimate the actual capacity of the media uh, for, for treatment. So on week four, we went uh, the our sub went ahead and and uh, doubled the flow rate, and and over the over the period on the fourth week, we saw uh, the effluent uh, pretty close to breakthrough, or close to breakthrough. Uh, the table on the left estimates the uh, removal capacity based on the test results and the flow study. Again, similar to Fenton's, we did see complete removal of 1,4-dioxane and vinyl chloride uh, uh, through, the, through the lead vessel. Now, in parallel to the pilot studies, we also performed, we also did a comparative evaluation of the two technologies. This included uh, a life cycle cost assessment as well. Uh, we developed planning level uh, uh, project cost that included capital construction cost and an O&M cost. I had the LCA perform over a 20 year period. Uh, so this table here summarizes the compar comparative, uh, 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 the, um, summarizes the comparative valuation. Uh, basically, Fenton's chemistry had a lower capital cost compared to uh, Amber, Amber Sub system. Uh, in fact, was about eight times as expensive uh, as a Fenton system. Uh, we know that Fenton systems completely destroys the contaminant of concern, uh, and and the operations are much simpler. Uh, the primary benefit of Ambersoft system is there's no requirement of chemicals. However, uh, there are re utility requirements associated with the regeneration process. The, the operation is also slightly complex and, and also uh, which requires additional manpower. And, and Ambersoft would also require disposal of the regenerated waste stream. So based on the pilot testing, uh, Fenton's chemistry was recommended for full scale implementation. Uh, and and this slide here shows the process uh, for full scale implementation. Uh, essentially, the incoming water would go through a pH adjustment step, uh, where the pH of the groundwater would be reduced uh, uh, to a set point pH. Uh, a new sulfuric acid system uh, would be designed and installed. Uh, the pH adjusted water would then go into the Fenton's reactor, uh, which is designed for a flow, uh, for, uh, which has a capacity of about 8,000 uh, gallons, which provides about 15 minutes of hydraulic retention time at uh, the peak flow. 
uh, and, uh, hydrogen a new hydrogen peroxide storage and dosing system will be installed uh, that will be dosed into the Fenton's uh, reactor. Uh, the treated water would then flow into chamber one of the existing metals precipitation system. Uh, in chamber one, you would use existing caustic uh, system to dose and bring the pH up back to 7.5 to 8. Uh, the pH adjusted water would precipitate solids, which will be removed in the subsequent uh, chambers of the metal precipitation and clarification system. Uh, the clarified water would then flow into the uh, existing uh, filter sand filters uh, for TSS polishing and onwards into GAC where uh, PFOA removal will occur and any polishing, VOC polishing before being discharged. Uh, slide here shows the preliminary 3D layout of the new uh, infrastructure. Uh, the building in the background is the existing groundwater treatment plant. Uh, the existing cascade aerators is located here, so we'll be demolishing the existing cascade aerators, putting the two new reactors. Uh, the new chemical storage facility will be adjacent to the existing uh, caustic storage facility. So to conclude, uh, a comprehensive technology selection process was implemented for 1,4 dioxane treatment. Um, Fenton's chemistry utilizes an innovative and sustainable approach. In the sense, a nuisance metal is proposed to be utilized for the benefit of the new treatment upgrade. The technology makes use of existing groundwater chemistry and relies on much of existing infrastructure for implementation. It would also potentially make the air strippers redundant. Uh, so Fenton's chemistry becomes uh, was 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 deducted as the most cost effective technology for implementation at this site. And also to note is that Fenton's chem chemistry could be further optimized. And as I said, uh, we could further optimize it to uh, close to native pH. And between now and the startup, we will be looking at aiming that. So before I get into questions, I just want to thank our client. Uh, to giving Parsons the opportunity to work on this important project. Uh, there are a few teams involved for in this project. Uh, Parsons Stability team from in based out of Syracuse, New York. Uh, Parsons Field Operations team. Uh, they, they basically installed and ran the pilot system, and the engineering team who coordinated and developed the concept and the preliminary design. So there, I just move into the questions. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. That was a great presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can enter them either in the chat box, um, or if you'd like to uh, ask your question live, you can uh, use the reaction feature to raise your hand, and then we'll uh, call on you. You can unmute yourself. Um, I had seen that there was a question in the chat that was entered um, from Slavica Hammond. Um, is foul air with vinyl chloride uh, stripped or processed? Uh, right now, the vinyl chloride is stripped uh, through the air strippers, but uh, with the new uh, full-scale implementation of the Fentons, we will be destroying the vinyl chloride. Okay, great. And actually, uh, she has a, a follow-up question. Um, what is the projected completion date for the full-scale installation? So we are looking into going into construction uh, sometimes uh, towards the uh, end of this year. Uh, so it'll be somewhere, you know, the project will be in construction uh, basically towards the latter part of this year and, and should be completed uh, by early next year, early to middle next year. Okay, great. Thanks, Ajish. 
Uh, if there's any other questions, please raise your hand or uh, enter the question in the chat box and we can read aloud. Um, so we have a question from um, Mihir Chokshi. Um, excellent use of existing conditions to leverage a remedial solution. Did uh, Was carbon footprint analysis conducted and how would the selected solution uh, compare against Amber's orb? Uh, a carbon uh, uh, study was not done for this project. Uh, 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 but, but uh, the comparison basically was from a uh, construction cost and life cycle cost assessment, um, basically o &M costs over the 20 year period. Um, so I actually have a related question to that myself. Um, in terms of, uh, so it seemed like the capital costs were higher for implementing Amber's orb compared to Fenton's. Um, is it the same for the O&M costs that O&M for Amber's orb would also be more expensive uh, or just the capital cost? Yeah, uh, kind of. So so yes, the, the capital cost for Fenton's was much lower than, than Amber's orb, but, but uh, the O&M cost, Fenton's, uh, our amber sub was slightly lower in O&M cost uh, as compared to to uh, to Fenton's, uh, but it did not make a significant uh, there was no significant change in, uh, in the cost that would kind of justify the uh, final sec selection of amber sub. Uh, so there was uh, even though no chemicals was used, there's some requirements for Ambersoft system. This included one, uh, the need for a boiler system for to develop superheated steam, uh, which increased the the electric or the power requirements at the site for the technology. Uh, we also uh, on a typical O&M cost will be slightly lower, but however, when considering that the media has to be replaced uh, over the uh, over the life of this project, uh, the O&M costs came out to be comparable. Uh, now to note is that Fenton's we uh, Fenton's uh, cost O&M cost was much lower than the typical. As I mentioned earlier, they're not bringing in uh, iron into the plant, and we are also using is existing uh, existing sludge handling systems. So. The overall O&M cost for Fenton's also was reduced based on these assumptions. OK, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Thank, thanks for the detailed answer. Um, I see Les Cordon had his hand up. Uh, you can um, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, yeah, I just wanted, hi guys, I just wanted to comment on Mahir's question. And I think Ajish just mentioned it. With the with the Amber Sorb system, there is a, uh, superheated regeneration requirement, steam regeneration requirement on that bed, and then the concentrated material that comes off the steam uh, basically gets transferred to another medium that is typically shipped off site for regeneration. So there's a couple of extra steps in there that likely, although a carbon footprint analysis wasn't done, it's highly likely that the carbon footprint of the of the Fenton's system is significantly less than that of what the Amber Sorb system is. Thanks, Liz. All right, we have a few more questions that came in through the chat. Um, so the first is from uh, Dan Patel. Um, he asked, besides removing one four dioxane, did all the metals of concern also get removed down to the respective discharge criteria using Fenton's? Uh, answer to that is yes. So we basically uh, saw performance of metals removal consistent with the existing uh, metals removal at the site. 
Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, next question is from Joe Watterson. Uh, he asks, what alternatives to sulfuric acid were evaluated to reduce the pH of the influence stream? Uh, we, uh, we have been generally been using sulfuric acid and we have prior experience using sulfuric acid uh, for reducing pH. And that was one of the major reasons for using sulfuric acid as, uh, as a, a chemical to bring down the pH. Okay. Uh, we, we did not do any alternative evaluation on, on the type of chemical. Uh, based just based on our experience, uh, sulfuric acid has been uh, have had no issues with using sulfuric acid. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Um, we have a question from Akshay Perenke. Uh, he asks, was there any residual hydrogen peroxide after the reaction? If so, is that a problem? Uh, yes and no. So uh, yes, we would have hydrogen peroxide in the system, but we do the typical quenching system for hydrogen peroxide has this carbon. Uh, so we expect if any hydrogen peroxide uh, in this, if, if there is any hydrogen peroxide in the system will be removed by carbon. We are also looking at having a backup system if required. And, and, and it could be either be uh, a sodium bisulfide system. Uh, if we do we'll see there uh, are backups required in addition to the carbon uh, at, available at the site. Okay, I think that actually answered uh, another question that just came in from Dan Patel of how would the excess peroxide be quenched? Uh, so Dan, if, if that didn't answer your question fully, please uh, submit something else in the chat box uh, or raise your hand. Um, and then we have one more question so far in the chat box uh, from Robert Condon. Would fentanyl still be effective for removal of 1,4-dioxane to lower concentrations if the drinking water standard was lowered further or the, the discharge standard? I believe so. So right now we got removal to the method detection limit, uh, 0.1, which is uh, during the pilot arm method, method detection limit was 0.17 uh, micrograms per liter. Uh, so which is way lower than any of the uh, uh, any of the uh, guidelines out there. So I don't see any issue uh, with Fenton's uh, getting to any updated uh, guidance limits. Okay, great. Um, that's all the questions I currently see. If anyone else has a question, please um, leave a few more minutes left. You can either uh, enter it in the chat feature or you can raise your hand. All right, I think we're uh, we're out of questions. Go on once, go on twice. We have about uh, six or five and a half minutes left, so we could probably take one or two more. Um, if anybody has any questions or any comments they want to bring up? Okay, I think we can. Uh, oh, sorry, did I cut somebody off? It's Matt uh, McGowan. I, okay. I just wanted to just jump in real quick. And uh, uh, and thank Ajish and and the site team uh, for for the work on the pilots. Uh, you know it was it was a lot of effort and and uh, uh, executed well with uh, you know a lot of positive feedback from uh, from our clients. So thanks for that and uh, great job on the presentation, Ajish. All right, thanks for that, Matt. And yeah, I'll add my thanks now. Uh, Ajish, nice presentation, very informative. Um, and a great discussion on an innovative approach to destroying 1,4-dioxane uh, XC2 using a, a methodology that is, uh, is green and sustainable compared to uh, alternatives and, uh, and low cost. So I appreciate your presentation and all the information that you, uh, that you have. And if you could go to the next slide, I'll introduce the topic for next month. Uh, in July, we have an interesting presentation coming up from Melanie Beck and Jim Schutz on optimizing in situ complex metals remediation through numerical modeling simulations. That should be an interesting presentation on 
uh, how we can uh, we can do things better using uh, groundwater models and uh, remediating sites more efficiently. So stay tuned for that coming up on July 14th at noon Eastern, and uh, we'll be sending out a, an informational flyer on that presentation and uh, Melanie and Jim later this week. So look for that in your email. And uh, with that, I think we'll close out this session. Thanks everybody for attending and uh, and for your time. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Uh, and just one one quick note, real quick. Uh, if anyone's looking to earn PDH credit for this webinar attendance, uh, there is a PDF that was shared uh, in the chat feature that you can download, fill out, and then email back to us, and you'll get a certificate for a one PDH credit. Great. Thanks for that, Jess, and uh, hope everybody has a good rest of your day.